SECfans.com, championship week. It's Alabama and Georgia, the two teams we predicted at the beginning of the season. I think the two teams that most people predicted, so we're not really taking a victory lap there. I want to remind everybody before we get into this, please subscribe. Uh, Georgia fans, we haven't talked as much about your team this year. Obviously, we've been on your team a lot because you're, you're one of the better teams in the country. Um, and we'll kind of show that in this conversation we're going to have. But if you're new to our channel or if you have kind of been thinking maybe you should, you should. Subscribe. We talk about Georgia football all the time because we talk about SEC football here. We are a data-driven channel. We like to get nerdy, but we also know enough about these two teams to draw some insights that aren't just from a box score. I want to remind everybody real quick, uh, Alabama fans might know this because I talked about it in my video last week, um, but this week we got Georgia fans. So um, a little project that I've been working on, I'm a software engineer by trade, and I've came, I come across a little bit of data uh, and, and real-time updating NFL uh, database for stats. And I created a website. It's basically just a website for you to search by college, and it'll spit out all the players and their stats either by week or for the season. And it's an easy way to just kind of see your stats by your favorite college team instead of having to search through box scores to, to track all your players. They're all there in one single search. It's called profootballdataproject.com. It is completely ugly. It's still not even in beta. It's not a, It's just a personal project of mine. We don't make any money, money off of it. I just thought I'd share it with y'all. So profootballdataproject.com. You, you can see your favorite college team's uh, NFL statistics by player. All right. It's enough of that. Josh, SEC Championship game. This is what we thought we'd have, these two teams. And the line came out today. It opened up at 10, moved to 13 pretty fast. Um, a lot of people are saying, and I agree completely, that Georgia is playing kind of their best football of the year. They're on an upswing uh, over the last few weeks. And even though the competition hasn't been great, we've seen – in Georgia, just that consistent taking care of business thing that we like to see from elite teams. Alabama hasn't looked as good towards the end of the season as they did opening the season. Some of that might have to do with competition. There is this one data point that a lot of people will throw in Alabama's favor and, and sort of uh, knock Georgia down a peg or two in its LSU data point. But to start this show... I'd like for you to talk about how you've mentioned in the last two weeks how you thought that Georgia was a better team than LSU um, and that they would probably beat them if they played today, even though that was a pretty lopsided win for LSU. So talk about your thought process there and then talk about whether or not you think this Georgia team presents a tougher challenge for Alabama than the LSU team they played and beat 29 to nothing. So in analyzing the Georgia and LSU game to start with, I think there's sort of two things to take away. One is how that game tracked and how Georgia ended up in a situation when they're losing 36 to 16. And then two, how much matchups matter in the game of football. So to the first point, and I've said this a lot, Georgia was running the ball really well in that game. And when Georgia, uh, Georgia had a drive right where they go, uh, the game's three to nothing. They go 12 yard, uh, 12 plays down the field. It's fourth and nine of the LSU 14. And they're in a situation where they can kick a full goal, tie the game up. And instead uh, they do the, uh, you know, they, they have the weird Rodrigo Blankenship uh, fake field goal attempt that kind of goes against them. LSU turns around scores. And from that point on, in my view, we never really saw Georgia, stick with the run for the rest of the game. And a lot of it, I think, was just sort of panic. But the next drive following that that failed fake field goal attempt, Georgia had three and out, two incomplete passes, and one pass to Brian Harrion for one yard. So, it, again, in my view, what we saw was Georgia saying, you know, we've got to score again, we're going to catch up, we've got to be aggressive. And you fall into this trap where you see – aggression as passing the ball aggression as breaking tendencies and using low percentage plays, low percentage plays aren't necessarily aggression. If you've got something you're good at, like running it aggression, a lot of times is going up to your guys, hitting them in the chest and saying, Hey, you know, I need you guys to step up a notch. We need to dominate the line of scrimmage. we got to move the ball. And for whatever reason, Georgia got away from that. And that's what they've been able to do for the past couple of seasons. Georgia has imposed their will 
on the teams they're playing. They've imposed their will physically at the line of scrimmage, especially offensively, and dominated in the run game. It's what Clemson, I think, is doing offensively to this year. I think Georgia is able to be the same sort of level of offense to a large degree Clemson is, where you know Clemson doesn't really throw the ball that much. And Trevor Lawrence is a good quarterback. Trevor Lawrence is also asked to do about as little at quarterback as Jake Fromm was last year. For the most part, Clemson do- dominates the line of scrimmage. They impose their will with a run game, and they re- only rely on the passing game as necessary. Georgia just didn't hasn't didn't do that in the LSU game. They got off track. As I said, they had that, you know, they they have that one long drive, the only time in my view they sustained the run in a full drive the entire game. Uh they try to throw it in that situation. Now they're down 10 nothing. They come back and and after they're that three and out, and LSU kicks another field goal and it's 13 to nothing. They do a run to Swift for three yards, a run to Swift to three yards, and an incomplete pass. So you end up in a third and four situation. And you feel like you've got to throw the ball, which is, you know, maybe fair. But it, it kind of the other side to it is when they were in a third and two or third and four, a manageable run situation against an LSU team that, you know, slight spoiler here, you know, or I say slight spoiler, but LSU's giving up, you know, quite a bit of yardage about, I think about three and a half, four yards per carry on average. A, a third and four situation for Georgia is extremely makeable against LSU. It was all game, uh, you know, Georgia, LSU, Georgia, averaged uh 3.8 yards per carry which wasn't doesn't sound great but that's taking in Fromm's averages you know Swift averaged six yards per carry Holyfield averaged eight so when you're in a third and four and odds are if you put Holyfield in the game he's probably going to run for a first down so that's that's my first bit Georgia got out of sync and all that the second bit is it's all about matchups Georgia's strength is in pass defense their weakness is in run defense this is the real spoiler to the model. Georgia's allowing 92% of opponent rush averages and only allowing 79% of opponent passing averages. We have a lot of times we'll see where run defense is really good and the pass defense is poor. Um, Texas A&M and Missouri in particular are horrific in pass defense, but very good run defenses. Um, Georgia is in one of the unusual cases where it's the other way around. And LSU was a really tough game because LSU is – a lineup hits you in the mouth, try to run the ball and have success offense. And Georgia, with a run defense being what it was, LSU was more or less able to stay on schedule running the ball and have sustained drives in a way that Georgia was not used to seeing, and I think it got them off track. Where Georgia is better is in the passing game, but LSU didn't really pass the ball a ton. So I think Georgia may actually be a better team than LSU. It's just a poor matchup. Now, if they played again and Georgia stayed on schedule, as I said in my first point, I think they have more success. Um, but you know, even if LSU wasn't to win the next game, and I think because Georgia offensively is a better team, I think they probably would have a good chance. Uh, the flip side is, even if LSU is the sort of team that maybe beats Georgia six out of ten times, it's due to matchups. If you were to play a third opponent like Alabama, Georgia is a better team than LSU overall has a better chance against a team like Alabama because the matchups aren't as unfavorable. Um, and I think that's very important going into this game. We're talking about, you know, data points and common opponents. The The other one that's more recent is Auburn uh, for both of these teams. Georgia handled them in a different way. 27 to 10 probably could have been a little higher. They had some red zone struggles that, you know, Auburn's a good defense. Like, let's make no mistake. Auburn is a good defense in spite of the 52 that Alabama put up on them. Um, Georgia had, we talked about how they had a lot of yards in that game and it was sort of not representative of the, in the points they scored weren't representative of how well they did offensively. Um, we saw Auburn have some success and we've been critical of Auburn this year for not having a great rushing attack. And we saw them have some success against Alabama just running up the middle, just power run, running back, no quarterback threat to run. No, There was one drive that they scored on where they just they pounded it up the middle. They didn't throw it until the very end. Um, and then kind of like what you're saying here, they went back to just throwing the ball and, and it ended up costing them. But anyway, um, you got to think that if if teams, and you even flagged that going in the game, that, that – Auburn could have some success running the ball. If teams that have struggled to run the ball this year have had success against Alabama, especially a team like Auburn, um, well, Georgia's coming in with a really good running attack and really 
good running backs, elite running backs. Um, Swift's healthy. Holyfield's been who he has been this year. Um, so if you're an Alabama fan, knowing all that, are you concerned now that you've got a team that can run the ball and has a quarterback that can throw it? I think you should be, uh, at least to a certain extent. I, I've maintained this all year, and I, I know you know this. In my view, the way you beat Alabama this year is by have, is by running the football. I, I think I don't think Alabama is vulnerable, like weak against the run, but they're beatable against the run. I, I've seen it enough watching them this year. Teams have had success running the ball on them, and if you look at Alabama's rushing defense this season, um, there's a lot of garbage time numbers here, so it's kind of difficult to peg out, but. Arkansas ran for 5.6 yards per carry. Louisiana Lafayette ran for 5.3 yards per carry. Um, Texas A&M ran for 4.6. Citadel ran for 4.6, which is triple option. You got to kind of be careful, worry with that. But the point being, it's not one-off games. I mean, they've Alabama has given up five yards a carry um, three different times this year. They've given up four and a half or more five times this year. So it is possible to run on Alabama. And if you're able to do that, you should be able to put up some points. Um, all those teams were able to put up a, you know, points in that game and or points in games against Alabama. And I think Georgia's able to do that. It, it's Georgia's bread and butter. Last season's Alabama team, I think was a little better against the run uh, when healthy. And that was something they were able to use to sort of stymie Georgia to a certain extent. Um, this Alabama team, I think you can kind of beat them straight up. So it, it's definitely an, I won't necessarily say an edge, but it's an area where Georgia may be able to do something that other teams didn't do. And I, I'll sort of break it down a different way. If you look down Alabama's schedule, I mean, what what in your mind, who is probably the best rushing attack that Alabama has actually faced? It, it I, I don't know on my end, but I, I'm, I'm guessing maybe it's either Mississippi State or Missouri, I'm guessing. Well, Mississippi State is unique in that they have – you know, two really good running backs and an elite running quarterback. So I do think the answer, and statistically it'd probably be Mississippi State, but Mizzou also has an excellent running game. Um, they have been stymied a little bit, especially when Locke can't get going to provide that balance, but they ran pretty well, I think 170-something yards against Georgia, um, something like five yards of carry. So, yeah, those are the two. Um, although, you know, A&M, not a bad running game there either, but nobody, there's no elite, you know, Nick Chubb, Sony Michelle type running game that they've seen this year to really either test them or prove that they're a good run defense. Right. And I agree with that. And to your point, you know, Mississippi state, if you look at yard per carry average nationally, Mississippi state's 12th. Um, I think that's kind of a weird factor because so much, so much of it is dependent upon, uh, the ability to run the quarterback and their run def their run offense has really ebbed and flowed with a, how well balanced opposing defenses are. But outside that Missouri's 51st in yard per carry generated. So nobody on Alabama's schedule is really on Georgia's level who's fifth nationally. And I say this, it's a similar thing we flagged and didn't really do a good job of picking up on it as much as we should have for something we saw Ohio State last week had not played, or excuse me, Michigan going into the Ohio State game last week, hadn't played anybody that was remotely on Ohio State's caliber offensively, particularly in, in the passing game. Uh, I don't think they'd really faced, I'm going to guess they hadn't faced a top 40 pass offense all year. So they had faced, technically faced two top 50 offenses. Western Michigan, who is a top 50, off, they're not a bad offense, but they're a top 50 offense as a product of their schedule. And then Notre Dame was technically a top 50 offense, but they faced them with, before Ian Book was named the starter. So Wimbush at quarterback and before Dexter Williams came off suspension. So they faced him in the first game of the year. And that offense was not a top 50 offense. Right. And the concern with these things is it doesn't mean you're bad or good when you don't face teams like this. What it, the concern is you can end up in these games and suddenly get massively exposed with a deficiency in certain areas in Michigan in that Ohio state game. In their case, it was their really their nickel corner. Walton got just utterly embarrassed on national television and their man coverage schemes that they ran 
they couldn't win their one-on-ones. And you can talk about the lack of a pass rush, but it's hard to get a pass rush when the guys, if, if Haskins felt any pressure, he had a crossing route that he could dump the ball off to for seven yards on any given play. It, it was incredible. But there was no way to see that until you played a team that actually had high-level receivers and a quarterback able to get the ball to them so that their speed and the lack of speed on Michigan's side would show up. Um, it's a little harder to show that in the running game. I'm a little less dis- encouraged because Mississippi State and Missouri did not get over two yards per carry against Alabama when Alabama really, quote, cared. But, you know, Auburn cared, and and I think Alabama cared against Auburn, and they ran the ball. If there's a potential here, if you want a wild card factor, Georgia may be able to run the ball significantly better than anybody's anticipating on Alabama um, and regardless of everything we're about to say in the model, I think that could be a completely different ball game than the statistics. It, our, our model can't possibly show that because we're talking about a set of matchups and factors that Alabama's never seen. There's no data on it. Um, it it's just a definite wild card going into this game. The other place that I, I'd like for you to touch on real quick before we get into the rest of this, because Alabama fans are going to string us up by our toes if we don't say something positive about them in a minute or soon, Um one of the places that I've been concerned all year watching Alabama's defense play is how susceptible the linebackers are to being exposed either from the running back or the tight end, or even when you have a matchup where, uh, you know, they're in their nickel look, but a, a wide receiver gets matched up on a, on a linebacker, those reads and getting them into position, uh, Matt Wilson making these calls, There's a potential there not only for them to be so focused and so aggressive on stopping the run that they might get exposed in the passing game and not necessarily from those wide receivers in the standard traditional look, but more like what we saw against Arkansas. Yeah, I think there is, uh, to some extent, a a concern there. Now, I will say, I think Wilson has played better as the year's gone on. I think Moses has played better as the year's gone on. They struggled early. They and it, it was mostly mental. They, there's a lot of talent at Alabama at linebacker. There's as much talent as there has been in recent years. You can tell they're lacking starter experience. Neither one of these guys had been a, a had started a full year at linebacker for Alabama in the past. They're not used to making calls. They don't have the Sean Dion Hamilton factor, um, who was a multi-year player for them. Uh, that's just sort of sitting there and making sure the defense is aligned properly, and it shows a lot. Now, the caveat I will give to this, it's, again, harkening back to the Iowa State-Michigan discussion, I would have more confidence in Georgia's ability to do that if Jim Chaney wasn't the offensive coordinator. The Georgia's offense has not been particularly innovative all year. They have not really shown too much in the way of wrinkles. It's been pretty straightforward. Uh, it's pretty straightforward pro-style offensive concepts. There's not been a ton of motion, misdirection. In the Auburn game, the thing that really got Alabama was Auburn threw the kitchen sink in that game. I mean, I I haven't seen too many games recently where you see like A11 personnel on the field. It really threw Alabama for a loop. And I don't think, I I just don't think you're going to see that from Georgia. Partly because of Cheney, partly the SEC championship game factor can't can't be discarded that in this game, it's not one that the Georgia coaching staff spent all off season preparing for. You know, they don't have a, a mapped out game plan for, you know, week eight play Alabama. This is going to be our, you know, this is going to be our game plan for that game. You've got prep work for the SEC championship game component, but it was only a couple weeks ago that they knew they were going to play. So you kind of scramble to get stuff put together. They're not going to have plays held back particularly for Alabama that they've been, uh, this is a big thing. They haven't been practicing on plays for Alabama since fall camp. I mean, maybe they did thinking they might see Alabama in the SEC championship, but you normally don't want to do that for an opponent you may not face. So I don't know that Georgia, due to style, due to situation, is going to do the sort of offensive misdirection, motion, formational gimmicks, or um, sort of strategy that gets Alabama out of position in a way that's going to exploit them in the way that you know Chad Morris, who's an offensive guru at Arkansas, was able to do, the way Auburn was able to do, um, with what was clearly scripted drives that they'd probably been practicing for all year, given how exotic they were. Um, I just don't see that from Georgia in this game. 
All right, so what we've seen lately from Alabama is kind of slow starts, which is the opposite of what we saw in the beginning of the year. And I'm curious what you think about this, because I have a bit of a theory on Alabama with this. In addition to, yes, Tua was kind of banged up or was really banged up, starting with Missouri uh, or maybe Arkansas, Missouri, and then and then on from there. Um, but with LSU – in particular, Citadel, Auburn, we saw these kind of slow starts. Yes, it was 16 and nothing at the half against LSU, but they scored a late touchdown, kind of a slog in the first half. Auburn, we saw it. It was 17-14 at the half, and then they just poured it on in the second half. Same thing with the Citadel. I know it's a Citadel. To me, it feels like Alabama is not even that interested in scoring in the first half. I know that's a stupid thing to say. But it's almost like every th- every play they're running in the first half is an isolated science experiment to see how the defense reacts. And they're building up this data set of information in their head in terms of how the defense is reacting on these specific plays to completely install basically their halftime adjustments to exploit the defense in the second half. Because what it's looked like is... You know, we even saw like the third down, third and three trap to Josh Jacobs that went nowhere after the first down run went nowhere against Auburn. Plays like that where it it looked like they weren't even really trying to get a first down and if they got it, great. Is there something there in that, yes, everybody does set up plays. Yes, everybody runs offense to sort of set you up for things later on down the road. But is Alabama doing this to an extreme where they can go out and get a touchdown where they want, but they're really doing everything in the first half to put you sort of just to maybe blow you out if they can in the second half. Is it something there or am I crazy and I'm overthinking it? Well, I think if you're suggesting that Alabama isn't trying to score every drive, there maybe is a little bit of being crazy and overthinking it, but I think there's a kernel of truth here. And the kernel to me is I think Alabama goes out every game trying to establish a balanced offense. They're trying to establish the run. They're trying to play normal sort of traditional football with a team that is better equipped to really just air it out. And it's kind of a constant battle with Alabama on deciding whether or not they want to be a air raid, chunk the ball down the field, aggressive offense, or whether they really want to, uh, you know, take their offense to the next level by throwing it vertically. And and I think they've kind of struggled with it. And one of the other things I've seen is it's almost like they treat screens and plays that beat pressure as a gimmick. Yeah, they're trying to run early in the game these traditional passing plays that are often a little long developing, um, sometimes pretty low percentage. And I don't know what's happened recently, but they've kind of abandoned the short screen game. They've abandoned particularly the easy short passing game that had been so effective for them early in the year. seems like quick slants and easy throws aren't really there. Um, a, a lot of it may be defensive adjustments, but to a certain extent, I think they just – they're kind of trying to pound the ball up the middle and be more of a play action passing game, throwing it downfield vertically. And they're, they've gotten away from the quick passing game, the more new England Patriots pro style offense that was very successful for them, where you leverage the extreme accuracy in arm talent of your quarterback. And it's like in the second half, they kind of, at some point, it seems like for several games, they've come to the realization that that's the style of offense they need to run, and they start throwing it more and more and more, and they get more and more effective with it. And then once they start completing those passes, it forces the defense to adjust, everything else opens up, and then boom, the game turns into a blowout. So I think you're right in saying that Alabama maybe runs a different sort of offensive style. I think you're probably right in the fact that it's almost an experiment in that they're running a traditional offense. But where I would differ is I would say it feels like Alabama takes about a quarter recently trying to run the offense that they wish they ran. And it takes them about a quarter, quarter quarter and a half to realize this isn't really the most effective offense for us. And when they adjust and run the other style of offense that they should be running, you know, all of a sudden they put up 52 points in a game. So Nixon would never say this. He would never 
admit to this or agree to this, but what you just said to me sounds like Nick Saban in his mind, let's just use Auburn as an example. In his mind, he felt like the ha- he had the luxury of doing that in the first quarter or the first half, whereas he might approach a Georgia completely different and in the, the sort of to distill this down to everything to, to, to the to finer point, Nick Saban knew he could beat Auburn. And so he had the luxury of doing this in the first quarter or second quarter. Nick Saban doesn't know that he can beat Georgia. So he's going to play full bore pedal, the metal, get as many points as possible with the thing that he might be a little less comfortable with, but knows he can execute well we might see a little different strategy against Georgia. Is that fair to say? I think it probably is something that's been pretty consistent with Alabama is when Saban knows he's in a big game and he really puts, he'll put the pedal to the metal in a way he doesn't in other games and he'll come out aggressive, but it takes a really good opponent for him to feel like he should do that. Saban is pretty particular in feeling like he needs to have an identity for his team. And his identity always starts with, the ability to impose a will at the line of scrimmage. And in these games where against Auburn, I'm, I'm not saying he thinks he was would have thought he's invincible in this game, but he definitely felt like it's a game where, you know, we should show at the start of the game that we can impose our will and run the ball. And then once we've done that, we can kind of open things up and throw the ball down the field and we've got control of the game. And when he plays teams like Georgia or LSU in the 2011 championship, or when he was down in Georgia last year in the national title, he's willing to be a lot more aggressive because he realizes, Hey, I don't, it's not about building an identity here. It's about winning a ball game. And, and there's this constant battle, I think with him mentally between when he wants to build his identity for a team, which is pretty particular in what he wants that to be. And when he wants to win the ball game, uh, which is a different mindset. So one more scheme related thing and matchup related thing before we get into the numbers, Uh, Georgia hasn't been great getting pressure on the quarterback, especially with four. Um, They're not very well ranked in terms of the SEC or nationally for sacks or tackles for loss. We've seen the teams that gave two a trouble, and they were LSU and Mississippi State. They weren't even really Auburn. Auburn didn't get home very often uh, against Alabama in that game. Is that a concern for Georgia because we've seen on the other side where teams like Tennessee knew they couldn't get home, rush three or four, drop seven or eight, and Tua just picked them apart. Is that a concern for Georgia? Are they going to have to do something sort of outside of their comfort zone to get home to Tua? Is this a different defense that maybe doesn't have the tools like a Mississippi State to exploit the one weakness we've seen Tua have where he's not great under pressure? I think it's a really, really considerable concern. When you're playing an elite-level quarterback, you have to be able to rush the passer, period. And Georgia hasn't really been able to do that with an incredible amount of effectiveness. And in the the Missouri game, as an example, Missouri threw 48 passes against Georgia. Georgia got two sacks in that game. So it's not like Georgia is frankly struggling to get sacks and they're, you know, they're second to last in the conference with 20 sacks, exactly half as many as Alabama has generated against the same number of teams. It's not like that's been due really to just a lack of, uh, you know, a, a lack of passes faced when they've faced more passing offenses, they've struggled to get sacks in those game, but they have a good passing to, defense, which is weird. Right. And it's, I think it's the opposite of the situation we talked about with LSU, where LSU doesn't get a ton of pressure. Or say, excuse me, I say it's the opposite. I guess it is the same. Opposite of the Auburn situation is the same as the LSU situation. So we talked about with Auburn. Auburn's past defensive statistics are, are just above average, even though they're a very high sack, very high disruption team. Uh, and they're, they're one of the best at tackles for loss or third in the conference in sacks. And what that screams is they have a really good, really good defensive line and they're able to generate pressure with the linebackers, but the pass, the secondary itself is quite bad. I think with Georgia, the, the passing game statistics are more indicative of a tremendous amount of talent in the back seven, but they don't have great pass rushers and 
the talent sort of makes plays by just constantly being in position. And I'll give you an example with Campbell at corner for Georgia. Campbell doesn't always play his assignment right. Sometimes he gets things wrong. He's been better recently, which isn't shocking given you know that he's uh, a freshman playing football. But he's always there. And for some teams like Auburn, you know, Dean and Denson and those guys, they can get just burned. And Georgia does not have that problem. They're always in position. They don't, even though they have to cover maybe a little longer, and that's all a little, you know, a little questionable, they're, they're in the position to make a play. And when they do get pressure, they're exceptionally opportunistic. Uh, and I don't know how many pick sixes at this point Baker has, but it seems like if, if a ball is tipped against Georgia, somebody is running it back for a touchdown. And I think it's really, you know, and, and I know you've heard me say this a lot, talent makes luck in football. Uh, those Les Miles super lucky teams were also ridiculously talented teams. And you can, I, I won't say get away with things, but things go your way when you've got speed and talent throughout the football field because those are the guys that get to the inter- the tip ball to make an interception. Those are the guys that are fast enough to get to the punter to block a punt. Um, that's what Georgia has going for them, even though the front seven has not been able to generate a lot of pressure. All right, so instead of talking scheme and sort of gut and this or that, why don't we go ahead and get into the numbers and see what the, see what the model says about this matchup, and then we'll go from there. Right, so I think both fan bases have probably heard our show enough to sort of know how the model works. If not, uh, we have a model you can search on our channel, a model video which you can search on our channel and sort of get a deep dive if you feel like a 25-minute math class. The upshot of it all is our model looks at how you've done against your opponents and how your opponents did against everybody else. And it uses that to build a projection for your offensive production in this game. And then based off that production and uh, how you've done historically through this season, it builds a unique scoring model for you. So our model feeds off the data of how your previous games have gone to sort of generate not only what what are you going to look like against this opponent based off how good this opponent was against everybody else, but also what have you needed to be successful and how successful were you when you hit certain marks? You know, if you have four yards per carry, maybe you get 20 points. And when you've had six yards per carry, you get 40 and you've done that consistently. Well, the model is going to pick up on those trends and build a unique scoring model to you because different teams require different things in order to be successful. In this game, the, the first intermediate statistic, and this is a completely neutral statistic is the opponent averages allowed. So uh, if you allow four yards per carry and your opponents average five, then you allow 80% of their averages. Um, It's a pretty flat neutral statistic. So I really like it. Um, Alabama allows 69% of opponent rushing averages and 77% of opponent passing averages. Georgia allows 92% of opponent rushing averages and 79% of opponent passing averages. Now we talk about this a lot against the run. You can be really dominant. It's pretty capable to get that rushing number pretty low. And in this case, Alabama has faced teams that rush for a higher average, 4.5 yards per carry, and they've held teams to a much lower number, 3.1 yard per carry. Georgia has faced teams that average about 4.37, and they've allowed over four yards per carry. So um, just kind of all around, Georgia's faced slightly weaker competition and given up about uh, 33% more yardage than Alabama in a per play sense. Um, 95% is what I consider dead average because everybody pass or run. Everybody faces a lot of dead weight. There's group of five teams, you know, uh, we don't factor FCS data in whatsoever in these statistics. It's really because the relational data is junk. Who's you can't compare your performance against the Citadel versus Citadel's other FCS teams they've played uh, and have it make any sense. So we have to throw it out completely, but you know, everybody plays some group of five teams, you know, your, your Arkansas States or, uh, middle Tennessee states and those kind of bump your numbers up. So 92% is really average against the run um, set under 70% is elite. So you have an elite run defense on Alabama and a very average one from Georgia um, against the pass. Both these teams are pretty similar about 78% um, from both of them. Those are elite numbers. Uh, anything under 80% is elite. It's just difficult to keep teams from throwing the football at a very high, high level Uh, it's kind of the nature of football. It's why an elite quarterback is so valuable because when you play elite teams, um, you know, they're going to be able to stop, uh, uh, stop a passing game or stop a run game, but they, they're not going to stop your passing game, at least not to a high extent. 
So uh, based off all that, you know, how does this actually turn out? It, it's pretty simple. You, you have got both teams will have some semblance of a running game. Alabama expected to have about 4.8 yards per carry, Georgia 4.2. Uh, the difference is Alabama is expected to average over nine yards per attempt. That's just because their passing offense is so good, not a negative towards Georgia. And on the flip side, Georgia is expected to average about 7.3 yards per attempt. Uh, we put 7.5 yards per attempt as effective in the passing game. So it's just not quite effective uh, from Georgia. And that's uh, the lowest number. So be the third lowest number in the season projected behind uh, behind Kentucky and LSU. Um, 6.8 yards per play for Alabama, 5.47, about 5.5 yards per play for Georgia. Again, that's, that is the lowest number for Georgia projected behind just ahead of the numbers they had against LSU. Um, and 6.8 yards per attempt is a pretty healthy number for Alabama, but that's actually still the second lowest number that Alabama will have generated outside Mississippi state. Um, still though, uh, that's a pretty good yardage differential. And that's why this model has Alabama 40, Georgia 28. The big number for me, obviously 40, 28 represents a number for Alabama fans that they're not used to seeing defensively. Um, and would be really uncomfortable seeing their team give up 28. Uh, I know they gave up 21 to Auburn, but that game never felt like it was truly in doubt. The number that sticks out to me is the 7.34 yards per attempt projected for Georgia. And the reason I think it's interesting is, like you said, we see a 7.5 per attempt number to be effective. Like, So he's in that area of effectiveness. The problem is, so we've... Really like what we've seen from Fromm this year. And, and I think he's taken his game to another level that he wasn't playing at last year. And part of it is because they've kind of let him just sort of own the offense a little bit. But Fromm is is used a lot like Trevor Lawrence at South Carolina where he has really high yards per attempt numbers and gets the touchdowns and looks really good, doesn't throw a lot of interceptions high QB rating kind of guy, but not a high total yardage kind of guy. And we don't talk about total yards a lot on this channel because it can sort of be very misleading. But part of me feels like Georgia's offense operates very well because Jake Fromm might throw for 220 or 230, but it's 9, 10 yards per attempt. And if you get him into that sort of mediocre level of yards per attempt, they're not getting the total yards they need to be reflected on the actual scoreboard. So does that scare you? Even though we say 7.5 yards per attempt is, is a productive outing, based on what we see in terms of how this Georgia offense needs Jake's from to be throwing nine, 10 yards of attempt, does that scare you a little bit? It, it does scare me a little bit. And, you know, I'll, I'll sort of couch that too. I think one of the things that happened late in the LSU game when LSU got up a lot on Georgia, once Georgia started having to throw the ball a lot, they threw two interceptions in the second half. And to your point with total yardage, I think it's important to re understand, and we said this last year early on, and I think a lot of Georgia fans were really, probably didn't take it maybe the right way or didn't understand our point that Jake Fromm needed to be asked to throw a lot more than he did early in the early part of the season because we knew they were going to get to a point when you place an elite defense in college football, an elite defense will stop your run game. And they may not completely stop it, but an elite defense will stop you from being able to win the game by running at every play. You have to throw the ball. See and you Kentucky will get, versus Georgia. Right, exactly. And when you get that, you're going to have drives where you've got to throw it a lot. And... Georgia never really got Jake Fromm comfortable with that. And I think the first half of the SEC championship game, they threw a lot and they were successful. And then in the tail end of that, excuse me, the national title game, which I guess was an SEC championship game, the, the tail end of that, Jake Fromm sputtered a little bit on some key throws and that was enough for them to lose the ball game. I think we saw the same thing to a certain extent against LSU. They don't ever really want Jake Fromm to throw that much. They're not comfortable with it. They don't try to do it. If the run game isn't enough to carry the day, if they've got to try to like to your point, if they've got to try to get 300 yards passing in a game and they need that much volume, it changes the entire philosophy, the philosophy of the offense to be able to generate that much passing yardage. And I think once that happens, 
it skews the numbers in a way that nothing in the model really sees, you know, that maybe you end up with a different result because the passing game and the offense just doesn't resemble the sort of style that they've had through the rest of the season. So I'm going to go ahead and give my score on this one. It's to me, it's tough because I'm super high on Georgia right now. And I do think if we were just picking four best teams, um, I think Georgia is one of the four best teams in the country. So even, and this is what I say to a lot of people when they roll their eyes because they say it's a ridiculous thing to say. I, I'm picking Georgia to lose this game. I think the score is going to be, so our model is 40, 20, 28. I'm going one point below. I usually go a little bit more than this against the model, but 40 to 27 is my pick for Alabama, uh, Alabama, Georgia for Alabama. Um, one of the things I say, and this was a comparison I said in a discussion with a Washington State fan last week. They were like, why is Washington State ranked behind LSU? We have one fewer loss. One less loss than LSU, and, and, and we're ranked behind them. And I said, you haven't played Alabama. Do you really think that if Washington State played Alabama, they would only have one loss because they've already lost to Southern Cal, who's you know, not even going to a bowl this year? The same thing can be said about Georgia. Is it fair that they get punished because they've already got the one loss, but everybody's got a loss. Ohio State's got a terrible loss. They lost bigger to Purdue than Georgia did to LSU. Um, obviously, Michigan's out now. So uh, Oklahoma lost to Texas. So Georgia has this one loss like everybody else. But instead of playing a Texas or even worse, a Northwestern or a Pitt like Clemson is, they're playing a team that metrics say everybody would lose to. So is it fair to penalize Georgia in, in a situation where they, let's say they do lose this game 40 to 27, which is not a bad loss to Alabama the way they're playing this year. Is it fair to punish Georgia and kick them out of the playoffs because they have a loss to a team that everybody would lose to? Or is it just that's part of being in the SEC, you get some benefits of being in the SEC, and this is one of the downsides of the SEC, and that's life in the NFL? I, I think there's two sides to this coin. And I think on one hand, if you consider the playoffs to something that you earn your right to get into, right? If you really are just saying we pick the four best teams and that they get to play in a playoff, which is almost its own mini season at the end of the year, it's extremely unfair because Georgia should be viewed on the merits of, like you said, if somebody else, if these other teams have played this schedule, what do you think would have happened? And it's one thing to say, like with Ohio State's case, when you lose bad to Purdue, most teams would not have lost bad to Purdue. And, you know, it's easy to, if you put, a Georgia or an Alabama in Ohio state schedule this year with Ohio state schedule being what it was, I think 11 and one is almost a worst case. Uh, quite, quite frankly, I don't think Georgia could almost could lose to anyone, but Michigan on that schedule as much as Michigan got exposed because the rest of the schedule was not very hard. And I don't think Georgia would have lost to Purdue. I certainly don't think they would have lost to Purdue by four touchdowns. And the flip side, if Ohio state had to play Georgia's schedule, I don't know how they would have done. I don't know how they would have done against an LSU team that has a great secondary. You know, I don't, I don't know how they would have done against somebody like Auburn. So that's tough. And like you said, there's this extra data point that once you factor in, okay, well, could they have beaten LSU and Alabama? I, I don't think so. I don't, I don't see any way that Ohio State has any better than one loss in that scenario. And given their Purdue loss, I figure they're going to lose a different game. And so you're looking at probably what Ohio State showed on the field is that they would be a two-loss team with Georgia's schedule. So I, I think that's kind of what you have to do. You have to look at the teams, look at how they did against the teams they played, and say, if L Ohio State played Georgia's schedule based off how they did, what would that look like? In my view, um, it's probably 11-2, and two, counting the conference championship game. And, and vice versa with Georgia. If Georgia played Ohio State's schedule, at worst, they're 11-1, and one. And, and just miss the conference championship game. And at best they're 12 and 0 and, or 13 and 0 and win the conference title. And, and I'll flip it over even more. I think this also applies really heavily to Alabama in comparison to Notre Dame. Everybody was really fixated on Michigan because they were in the four spot, but yeah, I've been really critical of this. And I know Notre Dame fans keep getting mad at me about it, but if Alabama go, Alabama has gone 12 and 0 won every game by at least three touchdowns, 
with a schedule that is objectively more difficult than Notre Dame's, and now we're going to have this consideration that if Alabama loses to a top five Georgia, who's better than anyone Notre Dame has played, then Alabama is going to be ranked below Notre Dame because they they have a loss. Period. You know they have they're twelve and one. They've got a loss. We've got to put them lower. Well, we have absolutely no reason to think Notre Dame would have had this would have had a better record given what Alabama has done. And Alabama played a harder schedule than Notre Dame and did a hell of a lot better against it than Notre Dame did. So you're just straight up punishing Alabama in that case for playing an extra game against a team that's better than anyone Notre Dame played. And what that really gets to, I think, is the other side of the coin. It's people saying, all right, well, you know, we, we've got to treat this as a play into the playoff that, well, it, what they really want to say is, well, the SEC should only get one team in. And so right. if you lose the conference championship game, you know, they're saying, well, that, that means you're knocked out and that's just a fairness thing and you shouldn't be in. The problem is that dichotomy of are you picking the four best teams, period, or are you saying that you have to play into the playoff and the playoff is like an extension of the conference championship games? People wanted want it to be that because they they hate the fact that Alabama and Georgia played in the national title this last year the same way they hated Alabama and LSU played in the national title when they created the playoff in the first place. I just don't think it's fair and it's not what the system's built to do. Um, so that's kind of the end of my rant. So yeah, yeah, and it's funny because everybody, everybody's solution to this is to go to eight teams. But the problem with going eight to eight teams is, if you're saying go to eight teams because you want all the conference champions in, well, get ready for three SEC teams to be in there too. Because at worst, two SEC teams are going to be in there, and one of them is going to be Alabama every year. Which means Alabama can absolutely lose a game. This weekend, or they could have lost to Missouri six weeks ago, and they're still going to be in the playoffs. So I don't think eight teams. If you're not an SEC fan, if you're not a, if you don't want to, if you're not a fan of an SEC football team, you don't want this thing going to eight, because in most years there's enough nuance there that you can keep a second SEC team out of four. You ain't keeping two SEC teams out of eight in, in most years especially if you think this whole thing is media-driven, biased, blah, blah, blah. If you think that's the case, then you absolutely want to keep it to four and not expand it to eight. Yeah, and the, the quick point I'll make there is you know, LSU was sitting at seven before they lost to A&M. And I know they lost to A&M, but if they were sitting there playing for a playoff berth, I think you would have seen LSU in a little bit of a different level. And all of a sudden now you've got three teams in the playoff, one of which is an LSU team with two losses that already lost to Alabama. Georgia lost to LSU. And then, you know, let's say Alabama beats Georgia. Then you have a weird situation where Alabama has beaten two of the other playoff contenders already, and now they get an additional shot. It's just all of this really boils down to the fact and truth that, one, people don't want the SEC winning the national title, and they want to come up with any sort of scenario that justifies that. And, two, they really don't want Alabama winning the national title. Um, it, but to your point, ironically, it doesn't really accomplish that. Yeah, but I mean, honestly, there's fans inside the SEC that are sick of Alabama winning it too. Um, all right, so and I've said my piece on if Alabama loses, if Alabama loses, I don't think they should be in. Not because they're not one of the four best teams. I think Alabama, even if they lose this game, is still probably a favorite over Georgia on a neutral field, which is weird to say. Um, I just I'm so tired of Alabama teams giving other teams fodder for excuses. Just handle your business. Win the SEC championship. Alabama fans probably want to see some SEC hardware in there too, and not just not just win the national championship every year. Maybe they're happy with that. I don't know. Um, all right, so I gave my pick forty to twenty-seven. Give me your pick so we can wind this thing down. So, you know, first thing I'll note, it, it's kind of interesting to me that the the line just came out of the full lines on this game, and we have it forty to twenty-eight in the model. Um, so if you were to pick the total point there, that's 68 total points, Alabama by 12. The spread is 13 and a half. Going to, it's gone from 10 to 14, like you said. And the over is at 64 and a half. So we're within three points of the over-under, and we're within two or three points of the spread with the model prediction. So I, what that tells me is the model is right in line with what Vegas thinks the average game for this is going to be. I will tell you, in my opinion, I think this game ends up higher scoring than this. I, I think Georgia is going to be able to score points. I think that's going to force Alabama to score more points. So I'm actually, 
I have this game, Alabama 51, Georgia 31. Um, I don't think it's quite the track race you saw when Clemson played South Carolina, but the fact that Auburn has a better run defense than Georgia and Auburn's ability to stymie Alabama's run is what made them have some issues. And that's the thing that LSU and Mississippi state were able to do to a certain extent. Georgia's run defense statistically and in terms of overall performance throughout most of the season, frankly, has not been great. And because of that, I don't think they're going to be able to really ever get Alabama off schedule. They don't get many sacks. Alabama is going to be able to run their offense the way they want to run it through the entirety of the game. It's going to be extremely difficult for them not not to score 50 points. If that sounds unrealistic, I'm saying they score less than they did against Auburn and they really sputtered for the first half against Auburn. This is just one of one of, if not the best offenses that the SEC has ever seen. It's quite comparable and probably honestly, it's better than the Oklahoma offense that put up uh, almost 50 points on a better Georgia defense last year. Um, and then, you know, 31 from Georgia, giving them, you know, that's that's the most that Alabama is going to have given up in the season. So I, I, I think that's true, right? So the, you know, my, my gut here is that Georgia scores a lot, probably keeps this game close into the third quarter in a way nobody really has. They just can't keep going punch for punch. As I said earlier, the quarterback situation it, it, is such that I don't think that Georgia's really practiced or equipped to have the volume of passing yardage it's going to take to win this game. Uh, and that's why it pulls away 51, 31, uh, or, and by the way, if, if I'm right on that one, so that has Alabama under a three touchdown lead. I think that would be the first time all season that Alabama would not have won a game by at least three touchdowns. So it's as bad as that sounds, it's actually predicting the closest game Alabama's had all season. If I remember correctly, the reason I don't love 51 31 is because both of these teams run the ball. And if Georgia is able to score more, they're going to hold the ball more. So Auburn, while they did have some success offensively, they scored on, uh, basically they scored, they had 173 yard drive. They had a block punt that they scored on like two plays later. And then they had a drive that was, that had like 30, 40 yards of penalties and never really like they didn't run a ton of clock. If both these teams are scoring and both these teams are running the ball, I don't see how you get to 82 points because I think the game is shortened a lot more unless you're saying with this number that neither team really punts. Uh, that's that's more or less where I'm getting to with it. And basically, it really comes down to the fact that I think Alabama is going to run it so well that Georgia is going to have to do some things to compensate. And if you look back to, again, look back to last year's championship game, Alabama scored, what, 26 points in regulation in the second half? I think that's correct. So if they if they had that point total through both halves, it would have been about 52 points. I think this offense is better than Alabama's offense in the second half of last year. I think this Georgia defense isn't quite as good as that defense was. 51, as big a number as it is, is pretty reasonable. And I'm pulling up right now like a random site. So Odd Shark, uh, which is... an just a play, good place to get betting numbers when we were quoting it out a minute ago, has this game predicted at 50 and a half to 36. So yeah, I mean, they're, they're kind of saying the same thing. I am not saying it's going to come out that way. Who knows? The Ohio state Michigan game certainly showed why variability is there. We already had a long discussion on how if Georgia can run the ball with a high level of success, this game could end up being totally different than anybody could predict because it could expose a, a latent flaw in Alabama that may not have ever been able to be exposed before. But based off what's in front of me, that's that's just where I lean. Um, please remember to subscribe if you haven't yet already. Just like I said, comment below. Give us your score prediction. Let us know what you think. Uh, it should be a fun one. Either way, both of these teams are poised for a great bowl game uh, after this matchup. Thanks so much, y'all. Have a great week, and God bless. 